it's, it's a respiratory therapist's best friend because when you have to stick a patient to obtain some arterial blood, um, it's painful for the patient. And when you have to do that over and over again because the patient's unstable and you have to keep poking them, um, the vessels get damaged for one. It's painful. Um, and then sometimes they're real hard sticks where you think you feel the artery, you go in with the needle and then you miss. And somebody else tries and they miss. Uh, so patients that have an A-line in, you know, the job is a lot easier to obtain the arterial blood. Yes. So, we call that a, a respiratory therapist's best friend. Um, there's going to be a Teflon coated catheter that's placed in the artery and it's Teflon coated to prevent blood clots from forming on the catheter. Because anytime there's something in the vein that's foreign, then the body wants to attack it and um, you know, put um, coagulates on it to start blood clotting. So um, by it being Teflon coated, it'll prevent that from happening. Uh, the A-line will measure a patient's arterial blood pressure continuously, and it'll be displayed on the bedside monitor. So you get a continuous readout of blood pressure. It also acts as a site for drawing blood. So we can draw arterial blood, lab can draw their venous blood, or they're gonna draw arterial blood and use it for the lab. As far as putting the A-line in, it's done by percutaneous puncture. So the technique that you would use would be the same as drawing a blood gas, but once the needle is in the artery, you would slide a sheath into the artery that stays. Um, if that's not possible, then what surgeons do is they'll open the skin up and then um, visually see the artery and start the line and then suture the skin closed again. So indications for A-lines would be hemodynamically unstable patients. So if their blood pressure is sky high and drugs need to be given to get the blood pressure down, you'll be getting a continuous readout of blood pressure, so it makes it really easy. Same thing if pressures are too low. You need to add meds and get the blood pressure up so you've got that continuous readout. And then patients who are difficult sticks, A-lines are wonderful for that. So the picture is just showing the catheter that sits inside the artery. So the equipment that's needed so catheter, ID line, flush solution, heparin. Let me see if I can show it to you on this picture. All right, so the first thing it mentions is a catheter. So there's a catheter inside, typically the radial artery. Um, femoral artery could also be used, but it has more dangers associated with it. So radial artery is like the primary artery of choice for starting an A-line. Um, and then attached to the catheter that's in the artery is an IV line, and it has a solution running through it which is heparinized. So the heparin in the IV solution um, has to be under pressure because the, there's higher pressure in the artery. So if you hooked it up just to a regular IV bag and tried to drip it in, the pressure from the blood would still push through into the catheter and you would see blood filling up the, um, the IV tubing. So you need something under pressure to go against the pressure that's in the artery. Um, so you'll see a pressurized bag wrapped around the solution that has the heparin in it, and it'll push the fluid through the tubing and into the artery. And the heparin will just prevent blood, it will prevent blood from clotting. Um, so that's the next one. The AV bag must be pressurized. There's a stopcock to allow calibration of the system. So let me back up a little bit. The, there's a pressure transducer. And what a transducer is, it's going to take the pressure of the fluid against, a, it's a type of membrane, and whatever that pressure is, it turns that pressure into a digital readout so that you can see it on the monitor. Um, so it would be, 
occurring in this little transducer. So the pressure from the blood against the transducer gives you your pressure reading. And then you see your cable going to the monitor and showing you what the pressure is. Um, this has to be calibrated to atmospheric pressure, and that's what the three-way stopcock does. Um, the critical care nurses will calibrate this to room air every time they start their shift. There also has to be a stopcock or other device to draw blood, and it can sit in the patient's bed or sometimes it's back near the transducer where you would draw the blood. Have you seen these at the bedside at all, yes. on the patients that you're taking care of? Yes. So what you're looking at is the, the pressure transducer. You'll see the IV tubing attached from the patient, the stopcock for calibration, and then in here is the transducer, and then the wire that sends that signal to the monitor. So this one is showing three different catheters. Um, the one that says arterial will come from the A-line, um, right atrium will be from the Swan-Gans catheter. Usually there's two from the Swan-Gans catheter. So the level of the transducer makes a difference in how the pressure reads. Uh, so if the transducer is lower than the right atrium, it's going to have gravity pushing down on the transducer and that's going to cause pressures to be higher than normal. If the transducer is up higher than the patient's right atrium, now the blood has to flow against gravity and go upward, and that's gonna cause the reading to be lower than normal. So the pressure has, I mean the transducer has to be at the level of the right atrium to give an accurate reading. So as the patient's bed is moved up in the air or down, it's going to change the readings. You can, only, you can only believe the arterial pressure when the patient's heart is even with the transducer on the side of the bed. All right, so did you fill in the answers to the question? What happens if the transducer is lower than the right atrium? What did you write? <coughs> the pressure is higher. Yeah, pressure reading will be higher than actual. What happens if the transducer is higher than the right atrium? It will be lower. Yes, pressure will be lower than actual. When you're looking at the arterial waveform on the monitor, <coughs> systole, you'll see the waveform go up, and during diastole, of course, it comes back down. Um, with systole, you can see when the aortic valve closes because it puts a little notch in the wave. So next time you're at the patient's bedside and they have an A-line in, and you see their arterial pressure reading, notice that you'll see a little bit of a notch um, and that's when the aortic valve is closing. It's called the dichronic notch. And here it shows it a little bit lower down, but that's when the aortic valve is closing. <coughs> This is also a good picture for me to point out to you. When we're talking about EKGs and we're talking about the conduction system, um, it's only when the muscles depolarize that we see that on an EKG. We're not seeing the heart contract. The heart contracts after we see um, the depolarization. So if you see your arterial wave next to your ECG, you'll notice that you'll see your QRS complex, so the ventricles depolarize, and then afterward, the muscle contracts. So you'll see this following the EKG depolarization.
have you had any experience with drawing from A-lines yet? Yes. yes. All right, so with your experience of drawing from an A-line, did you have to waste some of the blood, throw it into the sharps disposal, or was there a reservoir in line? Reservoir. reservoir. Okay, so nobody's having to throw away the blood after they draw, mm -hmm. uh, or like the, <clears throat> excuse me, let me explain. Because there's heparin in the tubing to prevent blood clots, um, when you go to draw arterial blood, if you draw heparinized blood, it changes the value of the pH because the pH of heparin is 7.0. Um, so if you draw the blood straight from that tubing, you're going to get a falsely um, a false reading for your pH because it'll have the heparin in there that lowers it. So what you need to do is get rid of all of that blood that has the heparin in it to get a fresh supply of blood from the patient's blood. Um, so to pull all of that blood out of the IV tubing, um, the older way was to put a syringe in there, get rid of about 10 cc's of blood, then draw your ABG sample, and then you take that 10 cc's of blood and throw it away. You, know, you throw it into the sharps disposal. Um, big waste. I mean, if you have to draw blood all the time from the patient, now they're going to need a blood transfusion. So it wasn't the best thing to do. Um, so knowing that now everybody has it, it looks like maybe Broward and Memorial have the reservoir with the A-line. Um, you just pull that heparinized blood into the reservoir. Now you've got your fresh blood coming from the patient. You get your sample, and then you push that heparinized blood yeah, back in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's right so, this is showing two different reservoirs. It's showing a syringe mounted on the IV pole where you can use that as a reservoir. Or you have the, the VAMP system. Do I, either one of these look familiar to you? No, the first one so, I this is Memorial? Yes. What about this one with the syringe? I, we use a syringe. I've used a syringe at Broward. At Broward? Yeah. Okay. And then you just draw the sample right here and then yeah. push that blood back into the patient? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let me show you edwards.com. They have some um, videos. It takes about three minutes. system is the first generation of venous arterial blood management protection. The VAMP adult system standardizes blood sampling techniques for consistency, accuracy, and safety you can depend on. The VAMP adult system is available with or without an Edwards True Wave Disposable Pressure Transducer for a complete solution that protects clinicians from unnecessary exposure to blood, enhances patient safety, and protects your hospital's bottom line. Setup, priming, sampling, and flushing are quick and easy with the VAMP Adult System. The VAMP Adult Reservoir has a 5cc capacity that allows for ample clearing volume and can be used at the bedside, next to the patient, right where you need it. The self-sealing, pre-slit, non-latex Zitzite sample port is designed to enable the collection of undiluted samples while greatly reducing residual blood buildup and reducing the chance of infection. The blunt cannula design provides safety during the process by eliminating accidental needle sticks associated with blood sampling. The directory <coughs> system with blunt cannula provides an extra level of efficiency and convenience by enabling blood to be pulled directly into a vacuum tube. So this the was the old way. Family Closed blood sampling systems is designed to protect the patient and the clinician from complications associated with traditional sampling techniques. Traditional sampling risks involve removal of the stopcock cap and storing so that the inside of the cap remains sterile, accessing the sample port 
Storing cap and connecting the waste syringe places the system's sterility at risk. Drawing the clearing volume involves the risk of an inconsistent amount of clearing volume drawn and the risk of diluted lab samples. Discarding the clearing volume wastes the patient's own blood, thus increasing the chance that the patient will require a transfusion. Connecting sample syringes to draw samples requires additional access that increases the risk of contamination of the port. Transferring a blood sample to a vial via a needle puts the clinician at risk for needle stick injury and bloodborne pathogen exposure. Flushing the port to clear residual blood also puts the clinician at risk for bloodborne pathogen exposure. Replacing the stored cap puts the system's sterility at risk for contamination of the cap or sample port. Okay, so I just want to show you the two ways. Now that you've been introduced and then as far as the setup, that's usually set up by nursing, and then we just need to draw from it. All right, things that can happen with the readings, um, they can be inaccurate if there's a bend in the tubing that's inside of the artery. Um, and then that'll cause dampening of the waveform. So instead of seeing a nice waveform, it's going to be a lot smaller than normal. So if you see a small waveform instead of a normal one, then it could mean that the catheter is kinked inside the blood vessel. Sometimes the catheter has a, a, a whip to it. Like every time um, the blood pulses into the radial artery, it forces the catheter against the wall of the vessel. Um, it's possible that the catheter was not zeroed or calibrated correctly, and that's going to give you false readings. Um, there's complications to A-lines. Um, there could be bleeding. So if the catheter comes out, then there's a lot of blood loss because there's high pressure in the artery. So there's a lot of blood loss before that gets noticed. Um, it's possible for infection to get into the artery and into the blood. And it's also possible for blood clots to form. All right. So with monitoring venous oxygen, it is possible through this, there's a special type of Swan-Gans catheter that can continuously monitor venous oxygen. So if you're monitoring venous oxygen in the pulmonary artery, what would you expect a normal venous PO2 to be? 80 to 100? Uh, PO2? Saturation? Yes, 75%. Very good. And then a PO2 would be 40 millimeters of mercury. So that's normal venous oxygen. Normal mixed venous O2 saturation, 75%. Um, there's a question at the bottom. How can you tell if you drew an arterial blood sample or if you accidentally drew a venous blood sample? How would you be able to tell? Venous is like dark and then arterial is like red. Yeah, so venous blood is darker. Uh, but what if the patient's doing really bad? You have them on 100%. Um, you have them on 10 of P. The O2 stat on the monitor is 85% or 80%. And you draw blood. How do you know if that's venous blood that you just drew? Or is that actually arterial blood? So um, A-line, there's no question, of course. You've got the catheter in the artery, and you know that you're drawing arterial blood. But what if you stick the patient? Um, is it possible to get venous blood instead of arterial blood? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the vein can lie right on top of the artery or right next to the artery. And you think you hit the artery and you actually got venous blood. So that is possible. So if your patient's doing well and their stat is 98% and the blood is dark, yeah, you hit the vein. Um, but patients that you're not sure how low their oxygen saturation is, um, when you run the sample and the oxygen saturation is around 75%, then you know you've got venous blood.
So saturation around 75% is venous blood. Where would you draw a mixed venous blood sample from? So mixed venous, you want blood from all parts of the body coming together. So you don't want to draw it from the head. You don't want to draw it from the arms or the feet. So where could you draw a mixed venous blood sample from that would represent blood returning from everywhere in the body? You had given us this answer before, last semester. Yes. But I don't remember it. <laughs> you don't? No. Is it the pulmonary artery? Yes, oh, very okay. good. <laughs> yeah, and the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery has the blood that came from the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. It gets mixed together in the right atrium, and then the right ventricle pushes it into the pulmonary artery. So sampling um, blood from the pulmonary artery is a true mixed venous blood sample. Is it possible to monitor continuous venous blood saturation? Yes. Yes. It's through a special type of swan gans catheter that has a sensor on it for measuring venous oxygen saturation. So we mentioned that venous oxygen saturation should be around 75%. Sometimes it's lower. So I need you to tell me three reasons why venous oxygen would be lower than normal. Hypoxia. Okay, hypoxia. What type of hypoxia? Hypoxia. Patient has a fever. Patient has a fever? All right, so increased metabolism. They're oh. utilizing more oxygen. Okay. So fever causing increased metabolism. Oh, um. And you mentioned hypoxemia already. Yeah. So arterial hypoxemia would be one. You have very low amount of oxygen going um, through the arterial system. So of course the tissues don't have much oxygen. They end up extracting more than normal. So that would cause a low venous O2 saturation. Is it, I can't remember the name, where the tissues aren't consuming it? That would make it higher than normal. Oh, like okay. with cyanide poisoning, yeah, that's and the I'm cells thinking. can't utilize oxygen, okay. yeah, then you would see a higher than normal venous okay. O2. Infection? Blood loss? Um, infection goes along with the increased metabolism with the fever. <laughs> um, Okay, so low hemoglobin, low carrying capacity, the tissues are starved for oxygen. Okay, that's good. And what about poor cardiac output? You're not circulating the blood very well. Are you going to have a lower than normal venous O2? Yes. Yes. What would cause metabolic acidosis to show up on the arterial blood gas if a patient has poor perfusion to the tissues? So you draw blood gas and you see a low bicarb, it's 18. And you're trying to figure out why is there metabolic acidosis? What could be the, the picture of things going on with the patient? Yes, very good. Lactic acid buildup. So when there's poor perfusion to the tissues, the tissues are not getting the oxygen supply that they need. So in order to continue with um, normal metabolic processes, they start using anaerobic metabolism. But anaerobic metabolism has a byproduct to it, and that's lactic acid. So you'll see lactic acid building up and causing metabolic acidosis. I think you guys will find that you have to measure lactic acid levels 
if you're using the point of care system, they'll include um, those little blood gas um, machines that you can take to the patient's bedside. Have you seen those? Mm -hmm. I um, some of them measure lactic acid. I mean, they really keep track of lactic acid in the patient's blood because that would, that's the big indicator that the tissues are not receiving enough oxygen. And then what would cause the venous O2 to be higher? So instead of 40 millimeters of mercury with a 75% saturation, you've got an 80% saturation and a 50 PO2 on the venous side. Well, it gives you the answers. Okay. So you don't have to write them in. You've got sepsis where in severe sepsis, the tissues will stop extracting oxygen. Um, with cyanide poisoning, cyanide poisons the cells and they can't utilize oxygen, and that'll cause a high venous O2 level. If there's a high level of carboxyhemoglobin, um, carboxyhemoglobin in the blood prevents the hemoglobin from letting go of oxygen. So if you have high carboxyhemoglobin, the oxygen stays on the hemoglobin and never gets delivered to the tissues. Or if the patient is being over-oxygenated, if we have them on the ventilator and we're giving them too much oxygen, that'll cause venous O2 to be higher than normal. All right, so that's it. Now we go into balloon pumps. All right, if you have any patients that are in heart failure, um, there may be a machine sitting at the bottom of the bed and the machine is a balloon pump, and there will be a catheter going from that machine into the femoral artery, and it leaves a, it stays in the femoral artery, it stays in the aorta, in the descending aorta, and there's a balloon on the catheter. And the balloon will inflate and deflate, um, and it does it with feedback from the EKG about when to inflate and when to deflate. So when the heart contracts and pushes blood into the aorta, it deflates right before that happens so the blood can get past it. As soon as the blood gets past it, it reinflates again. And the reason for having that balloon in there is now you don't have any back pressure on the heart, so it'll give the heart a rest. And also it creates like a, like a vacuum, so when the heart goes to contract, there's no resistance to the heart contract. So that's the purpose of that balloon sitting in the aorta. All right, so what do our notes say? There's a long balloon catheter that sits in the aorta. It inflates at the beginning of diastole and deflates during systole. It will increase mean aortic pressures and coronary blood flow to the myocardium during diastole. So it's going to help with blood pressure, but the other thing it does is it pushes blood into the coronary blood vessels. Okay, and then we've got a video to watch on that. Got a strong accent, but it's just a very clear a picture of what happens. In increasing blood flow in the coronaries, therefore increasing coronary oxygen delivery. Okay. It actively deflates in systole, decreasing surrounding pressure, therefore reducing afterload. That leads to increased forward blood flow. These combined actions result in a decreased myocardial oxygen demand and increase my cardinal oxygen supply. All right, so that was it. This is Dr. Kelch. Play with oh, a review yeah. of intra-aortic balloon pump usage in myocardial infarction with cardiogenic This is just another picture of how that balloon sits in the aorta. Um, 
the gas that inflates the balloon is helium. And the reason for that is if the balloon bursts, helium will easily diffuse into the tissues and won't form a big air bubble. Um, if there's an air bubble in the heart or in the blood vessels, air bubbles actually stop blood from flowing past that air bubble, um, which would be a danger. And then you'd have the patient dying. So using a gas that's easily absorbed into the tissues is really important. And then for the waveform that you see when the patient has a balloon pump in is instead of seeing your normal arterial waveform from an A-line, it'll look a little bit different. Um, so the heart will contract and you'll see the pressure go up in the vessel, but then the balloon flates and this is being measured inside the aortic arch, by the way. Um, so the balloon inflates and you'll see pressure in the aortic arch rise pretty high. And that's a good thing because that increased pressure is going to push blood into the coronary vessels and perfuse the heart a lot better. So you'll always see two waveforms. Normal, without the balloon pump balloon, and then after the balloon inflates, it causes a second rise in pressure. All right, this helps the heart in two ways. The first way, it improves coronary perfusion by inflating at the end of systole and forcing blood into the coronary arteries. So that's number one. Number two, it lowers systemic vascular resistance by reducing afterload on the heart. And then it explains that in parentheses. It says the inflated balloon occupies space which, when deflated, it results in less afterload for the heart. So the bottom line is there's less workload on the heart, therefore the heart doesn't need to consume as much oxygen in order to function well. All right, so who gets a balloon pump placed? It's anybody who's in cardiogenic shock. Um, or it could be something that um, they use after surgery. So they go, they take the patient into open heart surgery, do the bypasses, or put in a new valve, and then afterward, when the patient's coming off of bypass, like the blood is bypassed um, to a perfusion pump, when it's returned back to the body and the heart's contracting, it might kind of be in shock after the surgery and not perform very well. So they'll put a balloon pump in, and the patient will come back from surgery with the balloon pump in. Um, so it gives the heart a rest and allows it to recover. So hopefully it's two or three days and then the balloon pump comes out and then the heart's feeling better. So one of the um, situations that would not be good is if the patient is dependent on the balloon pump. So you give the heart a rest for two days and the heart's not getting better. Now what? Do they need to spend the rest 